in a democracy, the government of the day has a responsibility to create an environment in which all its people is given equal <coughs> access to education and to participate equally in the creation of the wealth of the nation. Money at the moment is paid directly from the taxpayer to the teachers, the schools, the buildings and the pupils. Under privatisation, private companies will come in to take a profit from your taxes to deliver those services. Over the last few years, schools have really become exam factories. It's about league tables and jumping over your neighbour and competing. And this government is sending a message to working class and middle class kids in Britain that they want factories, production factories to feed into uh, feed into businesses. Look at things like the literacy rate of the people that are imprisoned. <laughs> There's a direct link between education and people that, that uh, become criminals and take on crime. There's a direct implication between people that haven't got access to education and the people that are homeless or stuck in a state of dependency. You have a great responsibility to do the things that needs to be done to bring about change. equivalent demo 10 yeah. years ago nobody showed it at all yeah you don't really want to and any any political change that's ever come in this country there was a lot more trouble than this that's the point yeah. Yeah. the serious organized crime act makes it an offense to protest <coughs> within a square kilometer of parliament without permission so in fact that right <coughs> has already been removed so the idea that you can do it within the law is, is already false. I think that um, it's our duty to look at the law and reject it where it stops us from doing what is right. Why have we boycott fucking legitimacy? Why have we fucking find a fucking law of our own? Hey, the police. Um, I went to a meeting about suffragettes recently and learned that they had um, a bag especially made that they tied around their waist and it was made to fit a newspaper that they were selling, the suffragette, and it had a little pocket inside that it was sewed in to put stones in in order to break windows. These are some of the methods that our, our uh, sisters used uh, in the suffragette movement uh, and there was nothing wrong with breaking windows then. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. Yeah. I thought passionate protests had died after the bulk right? My mature generation considers itself righteous, responsible and well behaved, but we have dissipated the inheritance of our young and gambled with their security. We can't even nail a banker or corporate tax avoider. <coughs> I feel hope for the first time in decades. I've thrown away my slippers and I'm ready to join these magnificent young people. It shows how much the student movement has really got to a lot of the tens of thousands of old lefties, the kind of 68 and early 70s generation which some of us consider ourselves part. It's very interesting that two weeks down the line, even Miliband 
is saying that the tourists are vandals. The government were getting away with the line for month after month on the television. It's a terrible crisis. We're terribly sorry about it. Uh, cuts have to be made. You all accept the cuts have to be made. Which ones would you like? That was the dialogue. That was the whole national conversation for month after month. That's gone now. Now the conversation is, does this have to happen at all? Aren't the alternatives? It should be Trident that's cut. It should be the war that's cut. The banks do have the money and so on and so on. It's now mass political dialogue uh, in this country and the student movement has done that. <coughs> say were overwhelmingly school student uh, uh, school student demonstrators so they were, they were school students uh, in their majority they were largely at all when I was down in Trafalgar Square on that one assembly you know at any moment out of some side street or another another sort of massive group of school students would arrive with their homemade placards simply screaming running into the square embracing another set of school students form a human pyramid on the on the cliff Nobody in the square, I believe, actually had a megaphone. Certainly nobody <laughs> had a PA. When it decided to go down Whitehall, it just decided like some sort of giant animal that it was going off, and that was it. That's what we're here for, free education! Yeah. What? What? We've like, consistently got people down for each demo. Like, first demo, we got 100 people down, and we got uh, more people down on the other two. And every time, like, people have been shot by the violence of the police. Like we've been kettled for hours, like the last two times we've been, we've been kept there till 10 o'clock in the freezing cold. And the last demo it was shocking violence like the, with their truncheons. But I think a key thing to uh, notice is that it doesn't, it's not really dampening spirits because people are still more passionate to get on these demonstrations against the cuts, which is going to stop a lot of them going to university. The occupation of Millbank definitely inspired so many of, the, of my friends at school and other people that we knew. Um, people realised that the fight back had started and the walkouts were just a great success in my school. We had um, the younger kids having to climb over the fences and joining us and going on those walkouts. And from there um, we decided to occupy and it was, it was really successful. We occupied these seven people and um, our demands were met, which were actually about EMA. Um, we were asking that everyone on EMA still got their EMA and they went to the protest. I think that what the Kettling did was really just create an anger at the police. And I've heard lots of arguments from people saying that uh, the student anger against the police is destructive and, and that we should discourage it. But what I think is, well, we've seen what the police have done to the student protesters, like systematically beating them up and kettling them. And I think that it's sort of outrageous to ask students not to be angry with the police. And I also think that there is something real that they've, that, that they've got at, which is that... Um, you know, it's the, it's the government that are imposing these cuts and it's the government that are putting the police out on the streets to try and repress us. And the talk in schools about making active citizens and being an active, playing an active role in society. Well, I'd like to first give a round of applause to the fantastic active citizens from the schools down there. now and I think the bomb probably will go through with some little sell out either way but we need to remember the poll tax and the poll tax was scrapped years after it was a year after it was implemented and what we've got to do now the left that like, like, taken this room has got to bring in the next battalions of this war we're doing with the condemned government and that means in every single borough of this country reading trade unions getting petitions with thousands and thousands of local residents on it making sure that no student suffers in their education or suffers in their life because of things that have taken place in the last few weeks. A lot of the college students um, are also facing their EMAs being cut because obviously, you know, where they've walked out in process to save their education, actually because they missed the lesson, they're having their, you know, uh, the way that they can get to, uh, to college through their education maintenance allowance and being able to travel and stuff is then cut off from them. So it is very clearly a tactic that is being used but, you know, by the same groups of people that um, who are going to eventually have to push through these cuts, right? I work uh, as a youth worker providing educational services to some of the most disadvantaged young people in London who have been excluded from school, who have come out from prison, who have been bullied at school. And without EMA, it's very, very difficult for us to keep them in the classroom. So we really need to put this, you know what I mean, it has to be high on the agenda. We've seen a constant ratcheting up of police powers and uh, a constant kind of winding down of civil liberties that, you know, perhaps we once once taken for granted. I mean, I think it was about 10 years ago, or 10, 11 years ago, that we first started to see 
the use of Kessian tactics. And that's actually something which has periodically happened in history. Whenever you've got a mass movement on the street that's fighting for justice. I mean, the reason those young people were Kessian was because the police wanted to make um, those young people think that if you go on a demonstration, uh, we'll keep you thirsty, we'll keep you hungry, we'll make sure that it's really not worth your while to ever go on a protest again. Um, and the role they're playing in the moment is that they want to sort of crush these protests uh, using force. So I think we can expect the level of violence to increase. That's why I think in, in London now and actually like across the UK, what we really need to move towards is, um, is sort of teams of stewards who are very well trained, drilled, um, elected, that can, you know, uh, that can compete actually with the sort of militarisation that the police have and actually make sure that we all defend, uh, we all stay safe and, uh, you know, we can actually sort of continue to outwit the police. spread across the city. What I'm basically getting at is that we've shown these people that we're prepared to go to all measures to really, um, to re to really stop them. But I think now that we've established that, we've, like, the, the campaign's matured in many ways. We've, got to, we've still got to have intense direct action, but it's got to be, I think, more strategic in many senses. And we've got to allow for the general public who aren't too comfortable with direct action to be able to come down to events as well. We've got to be able to create that space. And I think it's really ironic here that if we start looking at the contradictions, this is like a week out from children's in need, and everyone's like, you know, 18 million pounds was raised, but how much did the police operation cost? About 20 million pounds? How, many, how, many, how long was the police officers there? So it's like, yeah, we'll give money for because for, you know they're helpless, but when they actually have a voice or when they actually have something to say, we pay 20 million pounds to shut them up. The journalist who said, um, well, the, the school students didn't really know what they were there for, and they were only there because they were dropped off by their parents who wanted um, to relive their student youth. <laughs> now, that might have been true uh, for him, but I did say to him, there were 130,000 students on the street, I'm not sure if all of them were dropped off by their parents. Must have been there last three times. Yeah. No bank. Uh, Whitehall and this Whitehall one. And this one. And we're planning on going our students are being oppressed. We're the first year to be oppressed. We're, yeah, we're the first year. Yeah, six, our year is going to be the first year he has to pay. Uh, up to, uh, Nick Clegg lied piece. to us. He lied to us. Yeah. Nah, fuck this, fuck this. I'm going to fuck the police up. Don't get in my way, don't get in my way. Move, man, move. And I was like, okay, guys, let's just all calm down. <coughs> and I don't think it's quite tactical right now to go in, you know, try to negotiate with them. They're like, yeah, man, she's right. What can I do right now? What can I do on my own right now? There's nothing. I was like, exactly. There's nothing you can do right now on your own. Just going to go and fight a police officer. I mean, you have to wait for your time to be, you know, the best time. <laughs> <laughs> like, the my spoken word at that time worked. And I think... Speaking on the streets to people does actually work. There's a very distinct smell of marijuana around here. Whoever has got any, please share it with me now. I would be very sort of conservative about their radicalisation. The majority of them went for a fight. That's what they went for. Now that these things are going on, they actually tell you, shut up, listen, you know, we've got a radical here and they like that. They're attracted to it, but it's a very low level of politics. It's through the struggle that they've been radicalised. I wouldn't say they're radical now. They're going to try 
Fuck the police, yeah? Fuck student right. Let's do the uh, cuts and shit. You know that. I ain't paying nine grand to go to uni. Are you mad? Now, for those of you who don't know, the Bonnieus is very deprived areas on the outskirts of Paris. And we talk about 68 a lot, but I think there's another parallel here between what happened in 2005. Yeah. For those of you who might remember, big, big disturbances and riots with a lot of young people just very, very angry at their conditions there, and angry in particular at a couple of young boys who got electrocuted for being chased by the police. Now, the trouble there is that it was totally unfocused, and it turned inwards, and they ended up sort of smashing up their own communities, and they eventually got smashed off the streets by Sarkozy, a wooden scum. But where I think we have an advantage here is that there's that same level of anger, but the condemned cuts have really given a focus for a lot of these young people who may not be in higher education, may not be involved in the unions, but are still fucking angry. That's the beginning of a process. I mean, th this has happened so many times in history. You know, when, uh, when the levellers organised what they called the apron youths, the apprentices of London, who were exactly these kind of kids, kicked off like this in outside the doors of Parliament, forced the MPs to have to leave the House of Parliament by the river because they couldn't get out any other, any other way. So you think about it, you think that we've got a problem with the sort of starting point, if you like, of you know, kids in Hackney, think what it's like if you're a Russian peasant. You know, you were starting off with a very, very low political culture and they made a revolution. And what is really clear, I think, is the, uh, the radicalization of the student. Uh, the first, we decided to do a huge e EGM. We won the debate, a democratic debate, for occupation. And through the weeks, through the occupation, we had more and more people supporting us. Even yesterday, at the EGM, we had the student union guy that stand against us, saying that, I'm sorry, I was wrong, the uh, occupation was a great thing. We had people that wasn't into politics saying, I went to see the occupation, I went on the demo, and really, I feel like something is happening. Uh, we shouldn't imagine that actually uh, 30 or 40 universities going into occupation is a minor thing. It's not a minor thing. It gives the whole movement sort of focuses for organisation. It gives it depth. It gives it the ability to articulate politics over a long period of time to a key group of actors who transmit it to others. It politicises the movement. It gives it a theoretical framework, all of which is as important as the mobilisations on the streets. I just want to say, like, um, it's the first time I've ever, in my entire life, I've been involved in this. Um, so I was like, this is in the last five days that I've visited the occupation, and it's the most democratic stuff I've ever done in my adult voting life. And see what real democracy is like, because I've seen real democracy. Right, the students are at the vanguard, but we don't just want to sit on our laurels and say we are the vanguard. What's happened in a lot of the occupations is that they are bringing in the wider community. Sorry, can I, uh, this gentleman's from Hackney Community College, he's doing a meeting tomorrow between 12 and 2. He's already got an occupied from SOAS at the UCL. I'm a suffering pay freeze, they want to take the money off my pension, so actually it does unite us together. We will put three junior observers in the occupation, because if you're going to allow bail of thugs in and our students, we'll be there to actually see, to, to witness what happens and defend our students in that situation. And if you do use the bailers, we will actually walk out and go we'll shut the college down because we're not prepared to see that happen. Management have backed off. I mean, I was, I was panicking at the beginning. We, we called a meeting between uh, the UCU branch and uh, the student union branch. We shaped that meeting to be student dominated. And that continued all the way through the end of the occupation, which was last night when we had the UCU branch out in the, in the quad, you know, clapping them, giving them encouragement, saying, you know, great job. But the critical thing is here, whether or not you can get a nationwide wave of indefinite occupations of a mass character, which go, as only a few have now, for the central registry, uh, the central office functioning of the university sector. This is the critical next step. You know, you can back the demonstration off, off the streets, but it's a whole other thing to start dragging people out of occupation. When UCL briefly tried to close down the whole campus, the staff went absolutely bonkers at the administration saying, you've got to stop this now, call it off now, and within an hour, it was called off. It's quite incredible, really, that the way in which this good idea, which is that students and workers ought to be you know, struggling together and workers actually have a lot more clout in society than students, has turned into a complete fantasy version of reality about what is taking place at the moment and about how we can turn a student movement into something much bigger than just a student movement. A lot of people go on about 1968 and what happened in France in 1968. You know, there's a 
student song that sparks off the biggest general strike in European history. And what they get completely wrong about that is the mechanism by which the student struggle sparked off the general strike. Students occupied their universities first, and workers, particularly young workers, thought this was interesting and went along to have a look. And they went to the occupied universities and had their minds completely blown by the experience, and then went back to their factories and struck an occupied. It is not the case that students came out of their occupations, went to the workers, and then somehow this <coughs> strike. The mechanism that an awful lot of the left thinks should be in place, they got entirely the wrong way around. For the 68 comparison, we must be careful. 68 also was a different atmosphere. The student wanted to change the whole society. Although it's very strong, the movement here, this is not the feeling to strengthen the whole society. The NUS and UCU are organizing a massive static candlelit vigil. It's a it's close to vigil, they're not actually using naked flames, it's like a fire hazard. So what we've said is that we are we are going to march from Yulu at noon. We told the police that we may well have up to 20,000 people with us. I think we should stick to that, I think we should aim for that, and hopefully get more if we can. Basically not going to allow us to rally in Parliament Square because they claim that Parliament Square isn't big enough for the amount of people that we've got and that they can't take off the, like, the barriers around the grass. Yeah, okay. ho hopefully well, we'll be able to steward and like, actually do a march <laughs> as opposed to everyone just legging it. Loads and loads of Facebook groups have started up and have thousands and thousands of people in them. Some of them are saying they're meeting at Parliament Square, some of them meet at Trafalgar Square, So, which is why we called the emergency um, London Student Assembly last week and have agreed with the London Region <coughs> UCU to do a de demonstration to try to bring as many people from here as one big solid thing. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to be able to get the message out to every single person, so there will still be people meeting up at Trafalgar Square, at um, Parliament Square. The NUS have called for a, um, a 1pm uh, lobby of Parliament. One, one of the things is that they might say, um, well we're doing a legitimate lobby of Parliament to lobby your MPs, if we do anything else, that will prevent people going to lobby their MP. It could be seen as a smear or whatever, so we have to think about what we're doing. NUS feels like it has no option to um, do something on the day of the vote because of the pressure of the mass movement. Because the NUS's strategy for the last few years of beer and sandwiches <coughs> with MPs in Parliament has led to an utter failure. And it is this radical movement which has been built in the last month or so, which is really genuinely changing the position of students in this country and what people are talking about in terms of the cuts to education. A candlelit vigil on embankment is a product of the pressure of what everyone's done, the occupations, the protests and so on and so forth. And that's good, we've forced them to actually do something. It's also an attempt to contain the movement on the day and create a passive, non-confrontational event which doesn't go to Parliament, right? Now that is why the demonstration that Yulu and the London Assembly is called is so important. But I tell you, if people just go in small groups or even in quite big groups, the lesson of what happened in the last couple of weeks is the police will stop them, the police will kettle them because they'll be in too small a group. So what we need to do is to have a massive fuck off demonstration that is well organised and that says we as a collective body, the students, we are going to get to Parliament on the day they're voting to put up our fees. There is only one place where we want to end up, that is somewhere in the vicinity of Parliament, as close as you can get to it, possibly even inside the damn thing, <coughs> when the vote takes place, right? That's what has to happen. Now, there is a staring contest, I think, with the police at this point. If they try, and, at the end of the day, to block this particular route, to say, oh, well, we're not going to do it anymore, this goes from being an issue about students to being an issue about democracy in this country, to being a major social crisis. So my guess is the police will actually back down on the day. We've seen twice now, routes agreed, Massive kettling, collective punishment of demonstrators, historic number of arrests and attempt to intimidate and take away people's legitimate <coughs> right to protest from a government that has no legitimacy. If we make this about the right to protest, it's a way also of bringing in other sections of people, trade union leaders, celebrities, behind our right to protest outside Parliament. I think we should call
contact all the people on Facebook who are saying Parliament Square or uh, the Trafalgar <coughs> Square and say, no, change that. Come to you, Luke. We should demand that we go to Parliament Square and rally there. But once we get to Whitehall, I bet the police will battle us for every single inch down that road. <coughs> We're going to have to be prepared ourselves as an organisation. And that means good stewarding. It means clear leadership. And it means absolute steadfastness in the face of police provocation. <coughs> and even in this case, maybe the question of police violence. And I think that nothing less is going to do on the day. I think that's just what we're faced with right now. Yeah. All those in favour of a rally in Parliament Square? Okay, anyone against that idea? Okay, that's pretty much <coughs> unanimous. We're going to go down this road and we're going to get to Parliament Square. It's going to be kettle, there's going to be another nice. van set up for us, we're going to take people to smash up a van. So I think Parliament Square, of course, is the target, but announcing where we're going to go and what route we're going to take is a suicide mission. And we should say, yeah, gather at the ULU, we're going to get to Big Ben somehow, see what happens. Yeah. I think we need to discuss what happens if they try to kettle us a plug our route. So, I think it's, it would be great to draw up a list of targets, tax evaders, public institutions, etc. Um, and the list should be too long for the police to have people posted at every place. The shutdown London uh, element of it does appear to me, I suppose, plan B if, there, if it goes that way. So if we don't get to Parliament Square, that is when a repeat of last week will happen. And that amazing <laughs> cat and mouse game around London. I don't think it's one or the other, it is probably and all 99% likely to be all of these things. That's a student protest. Yeah? I mean, someone turns up and they don't look like that and they come from Hackney or something. They're not student protesters in a game. Of course, they probably are actually a student protest. This is something we actually want to see happening that I think much of the left isn't really picking up on. So I think one of the things we need to do is find some way to get into those sixth forms and those colleges. Find some way to sort of tap into that really what I think is deep seated radicalism that is now taking place there. My daughter, who's 16, phoned me up and said, she just, she was going home, she'd been kettled once, she was scared to put out the kettle. But, she said, do you know what happened in Parliament? What was the vote in Parliament? So I, I was quite surprised at this, because I thought, well, you know, why does she care? We know what the vote will be in Parliament. We know, we've already decided what Parliament is, but she's going through a learning experience. And I think that's an important thing for us to reflect on. 
Across November and December, we saw the country centre start to move left very quickly, and understandably, the right wing aren't going to be overly thrilled about this. So we shouldn't be overly surprised to see some sort of counterattack, particularly by the right wing media. As many of us have seen from the coverage of this process, the fundamental role of the media is in fact manufacturing consent. Um, and anyone that's ever read the, uh, the propaganda model by Chomsky will see it's particularly clear. And we can see from the reporting, over okay, Jody being pulled by his wheelchair to the coverage of Alfie Meadows, that the media is not telling the truth and we really have to fight back against it. It's been stopping the country from joining us because if people in this country knew the facts about what was happening to their society, the entire country would be changing overnight. They're just going to keep us down and they're going to continue to fight against us and we really cannot afford to ignore the media. After the big demonstration on the 9th, the movement will have entered a new phase. There will have been a big there will have been the vote and we'll need to decide where we're going to go next. Uh, the people will be saying to themselves, a lot of students will be saying to themselves, is that it? Is it over? And people involved in this movement need to say as soon as possible after the night, no, it's not over and this is what we're going to be doing. And so I think having a national meeting as soon as possible after the night is really important. And yeah, for practical reasons, I think the best thing that we could do is ask people from all the different campuses around the UK, who are going to be in London on the 9th anyway, to stay overnight, then we meet up and have a national meeting the next day, somewhere in central London, possibly in an occupied space. I don't think anybody can say now that there will definitely be another demonstration like these ones in, 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 in general. The people on the demonstrations are, are highly political and have got a very clear understanding of what's being done for them. And it's not the case that you can simply mobilise students again and again on the street run them against the state machine and hope that the next time they'll just come back for more. Because what could happen is like the famous saying goes, it goes up like a rocket and down like a stick. But in reality, we need to build on the momentum that we have. Why are we doing it to Vodafone? Vodafone has been let off by the government with a £6 billion tax bill. It's known as a corporate tax avoider! Whee! You may be interested to know that Boots, along with Philip Green and hundreds of our favourite billionaires, are currently dodging a £120 worth of tax. Now, right, ladies and gentlemen, 120 billion pounds of public money, they are stealing from you. What do we get for our non-existent 120 billion pounds? The closure of public libraries, the decimation of the NHS, savage cuts to higher education, to the health service, to welfare, to social housing, to the things that the very fabric of our society depends upon. But it's okay, because Philip Green still manages to move all his money to Monaco. Whee! If anyone gathered in Boots today would like to come and share with the audience we are clearly gathering about why they feel the cuts to public sectors will be hurting them, their families and their future, please feel free to come and use our megaphone. It is for the public good. This presentation is brought to you by Big Society Revenue and Customs. Here protecting your interests in the face of a government that won't. You're losing money guys, open the doors. I want to buy some 40 quid Clinique soap that gives me eczema. 300 million. But taxable, this is a victimless crime, right? I mean, your kids will be just fine, because really, a degree is a waste of time. We'll survive when the NHS gets privatised and the Lib Dems lied. But wait, if money's gone to him, that should have gone to us. Then why are we getting it? And why are the schools getting shut? And why did VAT go up when corporation tax is going down? Just whose money actually is this? It's yours, and it's the police's, it's the nurses and the teachers, it belongs to all the street cleaners, it's the unemployed, the young and old, it's the guy who sleeps outside the shop every night in the cold. But can't you see? We've been deceived, and it's beyond belief. So Philip Green, you dirty thief, pay your tax or we won't leave. These are democratic decision um, making bodies, these student <coughs> assemblies, where we decide what we should do in campuses um, in, you know, and in schools. And it's whether we want to do a national version of that. No, I mean, it's a very, very good idea to have a national assembly. It's been proposed in a number of meetings. Obviously, it's got to happen, partly because it does send out a signal that the movement isn't over. I mean, in a way, I don't mind necessarily what it's called, although I veer towards it being called a student assembly and then being open to people in ed education workers and so on. I tell you why, because the students are way ahead of anyone else in the movement at the moment. <laughs> Thank you.
students uh, bring on board you know, the might of the working class, local anti-cuts committees, local um, council housing residents associations, benefit claimants associations, um, campaigns to save libraries, all these kinds of things we've got to be looking at as well. Next time, if there's a, say, say it would be the second vote or whatever, there was a day of action, the students in the universities need to pick it their lecturers out. Yeah. Yeah? The students need to pick it the lecturers out. Stop waiting for solidarity, get on there and demand it and you'll get them out. You can kind of find yourself slipping into, oh, aren't well, the students great, they're all really radical, with a kind of behind think of, and I'll just let them get on with it. I'm even a bit nervous about being here because I'm too old to fight and I'm too fat to run away. You know? <laughs> <laughs> My activist days are over, but I've, I've been there, don't worry about that. What we've got to think through is how we get more people to actually go on the demonstration. I can vote through tuition fees. We will continue to march. We will continue to protest. We will talk to workers, trade unionists, the unemployed, the disabled, the homeless, and we say to all of them, join our movement. It's growing. We're getting stronger. They're getting weaker. We need a general strike to bring this government down. Censorship idea. The point of that is that it says we can't take action to some official or get into some of the other union bureaucracies and so on and so forth. And we've got to break from that. We had a, a union meeting this week and we debated a motion on a general strike. There was a lot of argument. People said, well, we're not ready, we've got to prepare, we've got to do lots of groundwork. But actually, we, we won that motion. A lot of people on the left in Britain who've been around for a very long time who understand theoretically that workers have more power than students. If there was strike action by any serious group, in particular if there was general strike action, this would finish the government in a way and in a time scale that the student movement on its own couldn't dream of achieving. Now all these are universal truths commonly acknowledged, but you have to get the mediating link between what's generally true and the actual concrete situation in which you exist at the moment. Two years ago, we came out on strike in UCU with the MUT. It was a powerful, powerful strike. The demand for a general strike today is one which is common sense. People know that the avenues to democracy are very much closed off to us. We talk about that the government is not a strong government, it's a weak government because it's a coalition government. That's true on one level. Of course it's true. It's two different political parties who have come together and they have disagreements and friction and so on. But there's one thing that makes them actually quite strong, and that is that they represent the interests of the British capitalist class wholeheartedly. The only way that we can really hope to stop that, to defend the gains which we've won over decades of struggle, is by matching them blow for blow. And the most powerful way that we can do that is a general strike. I think that's something that we should start talking about now. Not because everyone would agree with it initially. There's very powerful forces in the upper reach of the trade unions who are dead against it. What they are talking about is coordinating their already existing economic disputes with the government. One day here, maybe two days there, okay. That is not the same as a general strike, which by its very nature takes on the political character. I think there's a problem with the way that um, people pushing this call um, propose the issue of a general strike. And firstly, the idea that this is a, a fantastic way of exerting pressure on trade union bureaucrats is actually a bit misleading. If you look at a concrete dispute like the London Underground Jobs dispute, where the RMT has just made a massive retreat, and the idea that the way you put pressure on somebody like Bob Crow is to say the thing, the thing that's wrong with you, Brother Crow, is that you don't call for a general strike actually completely misses the point about the concrete role that he's playing now. And that's also true of Sir Watker um, and, and the other so-called like, fighting left trade union leaders. Um, so I think we should um, avoid making very windy rhetorical calls um, for, for general strikes which actually serve to let bureaucrats off the hook who don't want to fight now. If you are serious about the idea that every major union in this country will simultaneously bring workers out on strike. You are talking about a, a political situation which is one step short of what in the Marxist tradition is called dual power. That is that the government of the country is divided between the official ruling class and the working class movement and the institutions. There will be a conflict between the state power which will make anything that's happened in the last few days look like a picnic as it did in 1926 or in France in 1968. There's a bit of a problem if we build up uh, an argument around how do we defend ourselves as having federal education in our workplaces and on our campuses. If we then give people a tool, like a general strike, 
which is, bureaucratically speaking, totally out of reach. But the TUC, the organ which would call a general strike, effectively does not exist in, in, well enough, in good enough form to call a general strike. The TUC is not going to call a general strike. I, I, I don't think it, it pays as well to make huge calls for general strike, which actually linguistically create barriers to entry. I think what we will see is not uh, the coherent argument and very eloquently put as we put it today. They will see the same old lefties saying the same old things. So I don't think the language of the general strike uh, is an effective tool for mobilising students. Because if you give people this thing which is actually bureaucratic... Right, it's not about out. students, it's about workers, buddy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But again, the, the, the slogan general strike, uh, if we just make the slogan, doesn't actually concretely relate to how you get there. You don't get to general strike by shouting general strike. You get to the grassroots activism in your unions. Who's got a small dick? Who's got a small dick? in that chamber has just sat and refused to vote on the motion to allow us to speak, to use our democratic right to listen. You are supposed to be doing proper consultation. You said you wanted to listen to people's views. You said you wanted to represent your local people. You said you didn't want to make the cuts. If a, if a good 20 of us decided to go in there, we could make this intervention now. We can occupy it now. Does anybody want to do this now? Because that is the only way, that is the only way and single way that we can make an intervention. Who is willing to do this with me now? Can we go now? Can we go? like a bunch of morons who will be seen unaware and we don't actually, we don't even cognate the idea, you know, the fact that we're being screwed systematically by a class of oligarchs, from cultural oligarchs to business oligarchs to political oligarchs. The real message is this, to Green, to the Boot CEO, to the 24 millionaires in cabinet, we will not stand for this any longer. Is that our building or yours? The argument for socialism you can make in two minutes. What do you need to know? That capitalism is an exploitive society driven by profit, that we've got the capacity to run it ourselves, we have to smash the state again. The difficult bit is how you actually make the next step, and the step after that, and the step after that. You have to be ruthlessly honest about what's happening around you. We have a radicalization of the society, of the students, but where, what do we do with it? Because what we need is to bring an alternative to the people. I don't want 40,000 people joining the Labour Party because at the end it's the same. It's not enough just to keep protesting. It's not enough just to keep occupying. We've got to start with that and I think, I think starting by hating the police is a very good start to your political education in Britain today. And we hope the young people in the future will neither vote for Labour Liberal Democrat or Conservative. We need political representation in the next election. We tried Labour, it fucked up the war. In disgust at Labour, some people thought the Liberals would work. That quite fucked up in seconds. So uh, maybe there is another alternative that we have to build ourselves. But to have the basis for that, you have to have a mass presence of opposition before you can build a, a, a mass platform for electoral activity, and we don't have that at the moment. If we call the party now, I'll tell you what we get. We get the old left assembled in a room arguing with each other, and I can't imagine a worse place to be. This is a new movement. We don't know what this movement is. We can only see at this moment the, the, the vague outlines of how the movement might develop. When, when people see this, they think, how can we control it? How can we stop it? How can we actually turn it back? into an old movement, into what it used to be, or what, it, what, we, what we're used to, because they're not really prepared to engage with the movement. And I think that's what you see with many political people, with many of the political groups. 
is they look continuously back to old forms of struggle, whereas actually it requires us to think differently, to think creatively, and actually to develop alongside that movement. It's been like a boxing match. In the blue corner, we've had the complacent, flabby champion that's been in for years and years. In the red corner, we've had the, the lean, hungry challenger with a glint in the eye. And we're really, really shocked. We're kind of in our corners at the moment discussing strategy and tactics for the next round. And I think one of the brilliant things about the student movement is it's thrown up new organisations and new ways of organising very, very quickly that faces the direct tactical questions. And one of these have been the student assemblies up and down the country, and the other of those have been the occupations. And anybody who's been in an occupation will know that they, they organise uh, a lot of the time using you know, non-hierarchical organising around consensus. And everybody put their hands up like this, I explained what it was, and suddenly there was a bit of cross-pollination. It wasn't just, you know, come to the occupation and, and learn, it's take it out and, and bring these great new ways of organising. Like, you start off with, you know, a lot of divergent thinking, lots of people expressing loads of different ideas. We get a solution which works for everyone, okay, who likes, you know, if, if we get, you know, two-thirds majority or something, we're going to go to free this as a group, because then one-third obviously doesn't support it, and it's just forced to go along with it, or it's just excluded. So at first you ask for any blocks, it's like a veto. It's if you think this decision like fundamentally contravenes the principles of your group. And it's really useful to have that so because it might like uncover something which people might not have thought of. And a standard size is like if your heart's not completely in the decision, but you're happy for the rest of the group to go ahead with it, everyone feels they've participated in Decision. Make sure that everybody says something in the beginning just to make sure that everyone feels that they can talk and comfortable talking because the worst thing is people having ideas but not being able to say them. So having an environment where people are happy to contribute. Because like consensus can't work if you've got a multi-class system trying to come to an agreement. If people have inherently different interests, consensus can work. So who leads, how you choose the leader, even if, they, even if there is no hierarchy, who lead, who gets to choose, who facilitates, who facilitates yeah. it. Also, who decides when there is a consensus? Well, you may have, like, say, one or two facilitators who are you know, facilitating the meeting. Essentially, the idea is that, like, the group itself facilitates. So make sure that people are there to further the group and not to further get the group to do what they want it to do. Well, not even necessarily what they want to do, but not just go there to get it over with. When a decision is reached, you, if you came up with the idea, it shouldn't actually have to do with you as a person or your ego. Lots of the meetings that we have, which are like campaign meetings, we know that we've got certain factions in those meetings, mm -hmm. and we know that they, like, we know that they meet beforehand and come along and stick to a line, and like that makes it very difficult to do something like consensus decision making. I just feel like if we ever tried to implement something like this for like actual decision making processes that we do on a weekly basis, we'd have blocks constantly. One issue that immediately came to mind is time. I guess one reason why people go for majority isn't just for the power of it, but just because, look, we've got a decision, let's go ahead and do it now. Like, let's get things done rather than clapping yeah. around. Yeah. Does everyone want this kind of decision making? Yeah. Do people weigh up the time versus the benefits of it? It's really hard, actually. Yeah. This is all stuff like you can kind of continue getting better at. Like, it's an ideology which is, you know, prevailing in our society where there's all these conflicting groups which, you know, think that there's this sort of this zero sum game mm. where like one person's benefit can only come or one group's benefit can only come at another person's harm. Whereas consensus is all about, you know, it's sort of actually working out like no, that's bullshit. <laughs> Now that we've got Tory government, the left is really vibrant again, it's growing, it's powerful, it's really articulating something. I think we undermine that if we have a Labour government anytime soon. We've seen only our wealth divide get bigger over the last 20 years, and obviously we'd like to get the seat smaller, we want equality. But with our like end games where we're going, we, we do want to bring down the government, we do want to occupy uh, you know, schools, but we also want to occupy libraries, town halls, occupy parliament, we want to occupy countries, we want to occupy everything. Of course, breaking the government, is in one way only a beginning uh, as well. And we certainly don't want to perpetuate the cycle of lousy Tory government broken, followed by lousy Labour government broken, followed by lousy coalition government broken. We want a different society. We want a society where these struggles aren't constantly recurring, where we don't have to reclaim the same rights, fight the same battles, fight the same excesses of exploitation, but want an end to it. But the question is, how do you get there again?
uh, if we break this government, that is a very big step on, on, that, on that direction. But for that to move forward is, first of all, there are a large number of people who are actually convinced that there should be a completely alternative system. 